Now it's me, I'll go. Save the fly, never to be repaired. Good morning, good morning, welcome everybody, great to see you all here. I um, understand, I'm given to understand there was some kind of football game on the TV yesterday. Um, honestly, now I'm not joking here, you are looking at a bloke who has never watched an entire football game in his life, ever. So, I literally only knew that there was something on because the road was so quiet outside our house, which was nice. And, uh, and then only knew that we won because there were fireworks outside, which made me think, don't they know that children are in bed asleep at this time? Jolly people, but there we go. Anyway, so uh, if you're into that kind of thing, then bless you. I am going to start a series on the Ten Commandments, and we'll be looking at idolatry next week. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, let's stand together, let's stand together. We're here to worship God. I want to read a few verses to you to start the service this morning. This is from Proverbs chapter 3. It says this, Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. And then it says this, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, Submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. I read a quote this morning. I don't know who said it. It's one of these things posted on social media, but it sounded quite good. It says, when the Bible says, do not lean on your own understanding, the Bible is being serious. Your heart is deceitful, your emotions fluctuate, your understanding does not see the overall big picture. God never lies, God never changes, God knows all. Trust Him. We're here this morning to worship a God that we can trust. We're here to worship a God who never changes. It's great, I'm, I'm genuinely pleased that uh, England did well and um, I, I tried to show some enthusiasm over this, but I'm, I'm genuinely pleased that they did well, and, and if it makes people happy, then I'm happy for that. But um, there's something that makes us not just happy, but truly joyful, and that's coming to God in worship this morning. Let's pray. Father, today, we worship you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you that you are a God who never changes. We thank you that your understanding is so far above our understanding. And Lord, today, we may be struggling with things that we do not understand. We may be struggling with emotions that we can't comprehend. We might be struggling with situations that are beyond our control. But Lord, today, we can simply rest and be secure in the knowledge that you are God. Today, Father, I pray for every person who is uh, in, in a difficult situation. I pray for every person who is struggling physically. I pray for every person who is struggling emotionally. I pray for every person who is struggling spiritually in this place today. And ask Lord that you will meet every need in every place, in every heart, in every life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let us worship the Lord this morning.
to shout your name. We love to lift up your name. Jesus, you are God, you are Yahweh, you are. Oh Lord, you are, I am, you are everything to us. Jesus, you have done so much in so many lives. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, I want to thank you. I want to thank you, Lord, the salvation. The salvation is happening in this place. Lord, I thank you for the ministries and the different, uh, just the different facets of ministry that you are bringing to this church, Lord. And I want to thank you, God, that people are encountering you through that. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Thank you, God, that when you died on the cross, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a thing for then, it's a thing for now, it's a thing for all time. That salvation is available to all who call upon your name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Lord, infuse us. Lord, let us get excited about that. Let us get excited about who you are. Lord, your word is full of incredible descriptions of your glory and your majesty and your love and your grace and your mercy. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen.
just for a few minutes, just a couple of uh, notices. You can tell churches get back to normal when we have notices come. It's, <laughs> it's not a good thing. I'm trying to keep them as short as possible. Um, but firstly, uh, the Bible study on Wednesday evening, which is 7.30, as you all know, on Zoom. Uh, apparently, there's another one of those football games this week on Wednesday evening. So we are moving the Bible study to 7 p.m. Um, and so we would finish by 8, which I believe is in time with the kickoff. Pastor Malcolm, is that correct? Wonderful. I'm getting the thumbs up from Malcolm, so it's been good. So, uh, yes, so the Bible study this week will be at 7 o'clock instead of 7.30, and that will be for an hour. This week, I believe, is Elaine, is that right? Yes. Wonderful. Elaine is bringing our Bible study for us this week on Wednesday evening. If you don't have the link for that, please just email us or um, uh, message us on social media, and we'll be able to forward that to you. No problem at all. We'd love to see you there. Now, this evening... Um, as you will remember, last week I said that we will no longer be having, uh, for, a, for a period of time, our Zoom communion on a Sunday night. We'll be meeting together for walks instead down at the beach. Uh, I have looked at the weather today and it is not good for later on in the day. Apparently it's going to be quite sunny in the afternoon and then it's going to be terrible. So, I'm going to say we will have a week off this week and we'll start our walks next week. If you want to go out for a walk this evening, you are welcome, but it won't be a church event. Okay, so we are going to start our church walks next Sunday at Fisherman's Walk, and we're going to pray the weather in. We're going to pray a glorious summer in. Amen? Amen. 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 And, um, and we're going to do that. But this week, I haven't got much faith. So <laughs> It's, uh, when I looked at the weather this morning, it was 50% chance of rain at 6 o'clock. Um, so, we'll leave it at that. Now, before we move on, we're going to take our offering when we uh, sing again in just momentarily. But we've just been singing, shine your light and let the whole world see. And I wonder if there's anybody that would like to shine their light this morning. Anybody that would like to share something that Jesus is doing in your life for right now. Just come and uh, come wave your hand at me. And anybody, I always like to give opportunity for testimony on a Sunday morning. Is there anybody? Don't worry if there isn't, it's not a problem. Obviously, God's been quiet in everybody's lives this week. <laughs> no, I know, I know, because I meet with people in the week, I know that God is doing things in people's lives. But uh, if anybody would like to share anything, shout or wave. Come on then. Here we go.
Let's worship the Lord. We've got an offering basket here. Recognize that most people are giving electronically now. Uh, but if you have anything that you would like to come and just put in there this morning as we sing, please do this hand gel just here next to the basket. Bless you. Thank you, Jesus.
Just for some reason right now, I'm prompted to share the lyrics of a very old worship song. Most of you will, some of you will know. It is taken from scripture, and it's as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. And I just really feel God impressing that upon my heart right now, that as the deer pants for the water, so my soul is after you. That's the, the place that we should be in before him. The place that we should bring ourselves to before God, to be thirsty for him, to be desperate for everything that he has to offer. The Bible says that he will move through us like springs of living water. He will run through our bodies. He will course through our spirits and through our souls. And he will bring refreshing into every part of our lives. If only we are thirsty for him. He will never leave you wanting when you're thirsty for him. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs for you. I can't read it on the music when it's all on the different lines. I love you more than any. Uh, you are. You alone are my heart's desire, that's it. And I long to worship you. Can we sing that? Yes. I know I'm putting on a spot this <laughs> year.
just feel God wanted to impress that on our hearts this morning. When we thirst for him. Thank you, Jesus. Please take us. We're going to come around God's word. Just wonder, um, could one of you please get me a glass of water? All that talk of uh, thirst. It's, uh, and also, what I didn't realise actually as we were doing that, it's amazing how God works. It, it wasn't choreographed or planned at all, but I'm speaking this morning, uh, starting a series on the Ten Commandments. And of course, the first one is, you shall have no, no other gods before me. And that was very much alluded to in that song that we've just uh, sung. So, would you please turn with me in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20. Uh, of course, over the last four weeks, we've been looking at the uh, subject or subjects of the four square gospel. Christ the Saviour, the Healer, the Baptizer, and the Holy Spirit, and the Coming King. Thank you, sir. And it has been wonderful to be able to look at that. And I was praying earlier in the week, and uh, my, my natural sort of uh, follow-on from that would be a message on the Trinity. Uh, but I actually really felt God bringing me towards the Ten Commandments. I've never preached on the Ten Commandments before, uh, directly anyway. And I, I just really felt that this was God, where God wanted us to go. So I spent a lot of time this week researching uh, the Ten Commandments, looking at the history and uh, the, the cultural aspect of it, everything that was around it. And I said to uh, Pastor Malcolm in the week, one, one of the main challenges as a pastor in a church uh, that is growing, in a church that is developing, which is excellent, and I praise God for that, and I thank Him for that. But one of the challenges as a pastor is to bring something which feeds everybody. Something which, uh, I had to look at the demographic and see how many mature Christians have we got, how many middle Christians have we got, how many new Christians have we got in the church. How many people who are not yet Christians do we have in the church? And then it's bringing something which feeds every person on every level of being able to communicate that to the church. And I really felt that the Ten Commandments was a uh, just a, a very basic thing in Scripture, but maybe something that a lot of us, maybe we looked at in school or something like that, but have forgotten over the years. So I'm going to read through uh, the passage of Exodus 21 to 17 this morning. Would you follow along with me? And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven or on the earth beneath or in the waters below, you shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of their parents to the third and fourth generation, we'll come to that in a couple of weeks, of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son, your daughter, your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Verse 12, honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land and love and the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor, you shall not cover your neighbor's house, you shall not cover your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to to your neighbor. Now, if any of you have been looking at your neighbor's donkey and been coveting that, then we need to have a talk about that afterwards. I do not covet my neighbor's donkey. I really like his car, but I don't cut actually. 
It's an hour. <laughs> that's a joke. That's, it's actually a very nice car. Anyway, should we, the question is this, should we as Christians today follow the Ten Commandments? After all, they are a part of the Old Covenant, are they not? The Mosaic Law, and we don't keep other parts of the Mosaic Law. We don't keep parts of the law because we are Christians, we are not Jews. We have no need to keep kosher, which is amazing because I love a bacon sandwich on a Saturday morning. We have no need to follow those things. We do not need to be circumcised, gentlemen, praise the Lord. We have no need to make sacrifices for the atonement of our sins because Jesus fulfilled that need in his perfect once and for all sacrifice on the cross in his death, his resurrection and his victory over the grave. So we say amen. amen. We now live under grace, do we not? We don't live under the law. Romans 8 tells us that we are free from the law because we live in the spirit. And praise God for that. But then 1 John 5 verses 2 to 3 says, This is how we know that we love the children of God by loving God and carrying out His commands. In fact, this is love for God. This is love for God to keep His commands. And His commands are not burdensome. And then, of course, we have the writings of the New Testament that make uh, throughout the New Testament in several places direct references to several of the commandments. They're referred to numerous times throughout the New Testament as well as Jesus himself making reference to the commandments. Does he not do that throughout the Sermon on the Mount? And what about in his uh, encounter with the rich young ruler in Matthew chapter 19? He actually says to the man in Matthew 19 verse 17, If you want to enter into eternal life, keep the commandments. Now I don't want to get bogged down today with the legalism of the situation. I'm not here to explore or expound the argument as to the necessity of the Ten Commandments today and whether we do or whether we do not follow uh, the Abrahamic law or the Mosaic law. I'm not here to do that today. We're not doing an expository series on the book of Leviticus. Maybe we will one day, just before my retirement, but we're not doing that today. So I don't want to go into those things today, but all I will say is that if you are a Christian today, if you are following Jesus with your life, then these are a very good way to live. And you will never go far wrong by having these commandments, not in your head, but written on your heart. You see, it's the spirit of the Ten Commandments. It is the heart of the Ten Commandments that I want to look at. And I believe that we see all ten of these commandments reflected in New Testament life under grace. Now these commandments, when they were originally written and they were given to Moses on the mountain in tablets of stone, what they did was they, they set God's people apart from the nations that were round about. And just remember, these people, they come out from Israel, they were wandering in the desert, there were all sorts of other cultures and influences around them. And by giving them this law, they were literally the first society to have uh, th this, this written law that they were to follow. And it set them apart. It made them different from everybody else around them. Who worshipped a multitude of gods and who participated in human sacrifice and in sexual indulgence and other such things. And whether we look at the Ten Commandments or when we simply take the New Testament direction, the one, that, one thing we can be certain of today is that if we follow God, we will be different. We will be set apart. You cannot follow God and reflect the world. If you follow God, you reflect God. If you follow the world, you reflect the world. And so if you are following God, you are different to everybody in the world. You are set apart. The Bible tells us that we are a peculiar 
peculiar people. That doesn't mean strange, although for some of us, myself included, that's very true. It means we are set apart, we are different. And I praise God for that. I thank God that I am not a reflection of this broken, tired, and grieving, and hurting world, because I have joy in Him. I am growing the fruits of the Holy Spirit in my life, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, all of those things which are of the Spirit of God are being grown in my life, and through that I'm reflecting God to the best of His grace at work in my life, and to the best of my ability to do that under Him. We will be swimming against the tide if we choose to follow God. Because we live in a world which is fixated with be who you want to be. But the true Christian is not interested in being who you want to be. The true Christian is interested in being who God wants you to be. You all know I've conducted a lot of funeral services in my life. And one of the things that really grieves me is that one of the most popular songs at funeral services is Frank Sinatra's I Did It My Way. So many people want that to be their parting shot. I did it my way. I can't think honestly of anything that would grieve me more than people saying after I'm gone, he did it his own way. How self-centered is that? How incredibly selfish is that? I want people when I'm gone to say, he did it God's way. How much more glorious to enter heaven to a chorus of angels proclaiming he did it God's way, she did it God's way. And that is all about looking out and not looking in. So what did Jesus say about Old Testament law today? Matthew chapter 5, 17 to 19. Do not think, these are the words of Jesus, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commandments and teaches others accordingly will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Now listen to this, the words of Jesus. But whoever practices and teaches these commandments will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. We have a duty before God to do that, friends. Not about being legalistic, but about showing a God of love because he set us apart for him. So let's come to this first commandment right now. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. There's the commandment. Now there's an interesting side note here when we look at this. When looking at the Ten Commandments in the way that the grammar was constructed in the original language, it separates the commandments into segments or into sections. We have, first off, I am God, therefore, with commandments one to three following. So God makes a statement, I am God, therefore, do this, one to three. Have no other gods before me, make no idols, and do not misuse God's name. And then we have this statement from God, remember the Sabbath day. And the next couple of verses show us how to do that and why that is important. And then we have, honor your mother and father. And in doing that, in honoring your mother and father, the next five commandments, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, don't be envious, all follow on from that as part of honoring your mother and father. The resulting outline. Now, I just must make a side note here. Some of us have, myself included, parents who fall way short of the mark. 
Let me tell you this today. Honouring them is not acquiescing to their actions in your life. If you have a parent who has abused you, if you have a parent who has not loved you, if you have a parent who has gone against God's will for your life, let me tell you this, honouring them is not a case of saying what you have done doesn't matter. It is about taking that and bringing it to God and forgiving them under Him. And that's a different message for a different day. But I find it fascinating how the resulting outline of this would be as follows. Right relations with God. The first three commandments. Right relations in the worship of God. The next commandment. And then right relations with society. The following five commandments there. Over half the commandments are about our interactions with each other as human beings. Is that not fascinating? It's almost as if God wanted us to love one another as well as loving Him. That's incredible, isn't it? God wants us to love each other as much as He wants us to love Him. And by each other, that just doesn't just mean us here, sat here in church. It means our neighbour. It means those we come into contact with in our lives. Matthew 22, 37, the words of Jesus again. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. All of the law and the prophets hang upon these Two commandments. Can you see how God brings it all together? And the commandment that we are looking at here is you shall have no other gods before me. But before we even get to this commandment, God does something interesting. He reminds the people of who he is and what he has done. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt and out of the land of slavery. He establishes himself as God. And in doing so, he qualifies that statement. He qualifies that following command. He's saying, look, don't chase after all these other gods because I'm the real deal. I am the only one who will make a difference in your life. That's why I don't want you to follow after all of these other things. Because I am the God who brought you out of Egypt. I am the God who released you from slavery. I am the God who will set you free. And none of these others will. That's why I want you to look towards me. How many of us have chased after things in our lives because they think or because we think that they will make our lives somehow better. Whatever it is, money, possessions, wealth, relationships, all of these things, there's a whole host of things that we can chase after in our lives, that we can seek after because they think, we think that they will make us feel better. And then when we attain them, how many people can testify to this? When we get to those things, we realize all of a sudden that they don't make our lives better. I think that sometimes even as Christians, we need a reminder of just who God is and what he has done in our lives. The book of 1 Chronicles, which was written by a priest named Ezra, and is largely a reminder to God's people, much as a, a parent would remind a child that although they might be punished when they sin, they are still God's special and chosen people. And that when God makes a promise, he keeps it. That's the message of this book. It says here, 1 Chronicles 16, 12, Remember the wonders he has done, his miracles and the judgments he has pronounced. Remember them. Remember the things that God has done. Verse 8 of the same chapter says, Give praise to the Lord. Proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Remember what God has done. Psalm 103, verse 2. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. God does wondrous things. There are a whole host of people here who can testify to that. 
Just last week, Sam stood up here and told us that people have received Jesus and the Holy Spirit. They had out for praise God. Praise God for that. Why? Because we are testifying to what God has done and what He is doing right now in people's lives. That is worth celebrating, church. And it is important that we share these things. It is important, it is vital that we do that. What does Revelation say? They overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. We overcome difficulties by sharing what God has done in our lives. This is why we share testimony in church. When we fellowship together, it is good to remember what God has done and is doing. Through this, he is established as God. Not only in our heads, but in our hearts as well. So let's look at this actual commandment here. You shall have no other gods before me. We're dealing here with an early Bronze Age society. A Bronze Age culture. Everything in the surrounding cultures, the surrounding nations, everything was a god. Remember, these people had come out from Egypt. The Israelites had come out of Egypt, which would have influenced their culture greatly. And the Egyptians were worshipping gods such as Osiris, who was the god of the underworld. There was Isis, who embodied the traditional virtues of a wife and a mother, and who was wife, apparently, to Osiris. Then there was Horus, who was the god of war, the god of hunting. There was Seth, who was the god of chaos and violence. And this wasn't even counting the gods of the other nations, the surrounding civilizations. So you can see why it was necessary for God to proclaim his truth to his people, to let them know that they could trust him and that they should keep their eyes upon him. But how does this apply to us today? We're not chasing after Isis. We're not chasing after Horus. We're not feeling the need to make human sacrifices to appease the gods. Or are we? Are we? What about the god of television that we sacrifice our children to? What about the god of woke culture that we sacrifice our standards to? What about the God of permissiveness and sexual liberty that we sacrifice our morality and our virtue to? What about the gods of status and possessions that we sacrifice our finances to? What about the gods of celebrity culture that we sacrifice our worship to? And you can see thousands of people crowding into a football stadium, hands raised in adoration. I'm not against football, I'm really not. I know I joked earlier in the service, but I'm not. But when you see thousands of people, hands raised in adoration, voices raised in adoration, yet much of the church in this nation remains silent, there is something wrong with the order of things. That's not a comment about football, it's a comment about where people place their worship. The gods that we build for ourselves. I believe that human beings are designed, are created to worship from the moment God formed man and the dust of the ground and he breathed life. The Holy Spirit breathed into the nostrils of man and he became alive. We were designed, we were created from the dust to cry out in worship. And I believe that every person worships something. We all worship something. The question is, can we place that worship in God today? Colossians 3, 5 to 10 sums this up wonderfully. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways of life 
in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all these things. Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which has been renewed in the knowledge and image of its creator. That is you today, made new in God. Psalm 40, verses 4 to 5. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. Many, Lord, my God, are the wonders that you have done, the things you have planned for us. None can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare. Stand with me, church, if you are able. So I know Sam's heard it back. <laughs> God, just listen to this. God is bringing you an invitation today. An invitation to worship Him, not because He has a need for attention like a strutting child, but because He knows that our wholeness lies in closeness with the Creator, our proximity to Him, when our spirit is linked with His through the blood of Jesus, allows us to access all that heaven has to offer. That is why we have no other gods before Him, because He is the only one who can make a difference in your life. He is the only one who can change you from the inside. When he is the object of your worship, when he is the one that you lift up in praise and adoration, I absolutely guarantee you that your life will not remain the same. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. What is it that is enslaving you today? What is it that is holding your heart captive? What is it that is holding your soul, your spirit captive? What is it that is holding your mind captive today? This is the God that will bring you out of slavery. So whatever is holding you captive as a slave, have no other gods before him. Remember what he has done. Ask him to set you free from that. And I absolutely guarantee you that he will. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Lord, we worship you this morning. We worship you because you are God, because you are the only God. Lord, let us not set up gods in our own life. Let us not set up things ahead of you or in place of you. Let us simply come to the throne of the Creator. Lay ourselves on the ground in your feet. And say, God, free me. And let me live. Let me live in you. Thank you, Jesus.
I was a bit gross, so. Yeah. <laughs> you picking up your glasses. You really have hurt your back, haven't you? On a serious note, let's pray for Sam right now. Thank you, Judah. How did you do it, Sam? In the gym? No. <laughs> you went to a, hang on. Just for everybody to hear, went to a water park adventure playground. Excellent. Let's pray for Sam. Come on, let's, let's, let's just pray for him. Father, we thank you for Sam, Lord. We thank you for uh, everything that you are doing in and through his life and through Amanda. Lord, we lift Sam before you right now. We thank you that he was able to go out with Owen and uh, have a great day at the water park. Lord, we just pray over his back right now. We pray, Father, that you will bring relief. We pray that you'll bring healing. We pray, God, that you'll bring a relief from the pain which is in his life, which is in his physical being right now. Lord, we bring this to you. Your word says, is any one of you sick? They should call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil. And the prayer of in faith will make the sick person well. We don't have the oil right now, but we have the oil of the Holy Spirit. And we have the prayer of in faith, which we believe will make the sick person well. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you that right now you are loosening everything which is tight in Sam's back. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. And uh, next time, send somebody younger. <laughs> God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, I will send out an email and a text about the walk later, so uh, if you're in our system, you will get that. But just have, enjoy the rest of the day off. Bless you. And don't forget our Bible study on Wednesday evening is at 7 and not 7.30. Bless you. If it's your first time here, it's out through these doors here and turn right and down into the car park that way. God bless you.